We are absolutely petrified of dementia as a culture. When you ask older adults things that they're scared about, dementia actually outranks things like fear of snakes and fear of a terrorist attack. The vast majority of the brain health products on the market today have no scientific basis whatsoever, and some of the most popular ones have even been accused of fraud by state attorneys. The only true way to achieve brain health is going to be by behaviors driven by you. You have to get involved. It's not going to come to you in a pill. It's not going to come to you from playing games. After getting my PhD in clinical psychology, I completed three additional years of training to really hone my expertise in the brain. I promise you there are so many things that you can start doing today that are free or low cost that will truly improve the quality of your brain. I want you to take your power back, take your money back, take your time back. And I know you want this too. The problem is you haven't been told exactly what to do. I want you to get excited and empowered about brain health. Let's get started today. So much for joining me. I really, really appreciate you being here. I'm so excited to tell you about my program today. We're going to spend about 30 minutes together with this lecture and we're going to cover six different areas. The first thing I want to talk to you about is what do older adults care about? The second one are the six problems that I see with the brain fitness industry as it is. The third part is my solution. If you're going to complain about a problem, I think you need to offer a solution. So my idea is the I care for your brain program and I want you to understand exactly what it is that I'm inviting you to be a part of. Over the last two years, I've actually been running the I Care For Your Brain program in person. And what I'm doing now is bringing that same program to you online. So I wanna tell you a little bit about where I've been to date and the things that I'm really excited that we're gonna to do together as part of this online program. So do you wanna know what older adults care about? Research tells us they care about their brain. Study after study, when they ask older adults what are their priorities, brain health rises to the absolute top. It's above social security reform, and it's even above physical health. A 2013 AARP study asked these folks, where are you getting your information? And of course, most of them said, where I'd really like to get this information from is from a doctor. But the sad truth is, you know where you're getting your information from? It's from the media. Corporations selling a product often sponsor these messages. And doesn't that bring their truthfulness into question? Supplements, computer games, and phone apps all promise to enhance brain health, memory, and sometimes even prevent or reverse dementia. The vast majority of the brain health products on the market today have no scientific basis whatsoever, and some of the most popular ones have even been accused of fraud by state attorneys. The big concern is that they're robbing you of the three most precious resources you have, which is your time, your money, and your hope. So let's talk about the six problems with the brain health industry. The first problem is that it's really an industry that's based on fear. It's really based on the anxiety that older adults have about developing dementia. We are absolutely petrified of dementia as a culture. When you ask older adults things that they're scared about, dementia actually outranks things like fear of snakes and fear of a terrorist attack. The American Psychological Association has predicted in the next few years with the aging of the baby boomers that dementia-related anxiety could actually become its own disorder. And marketers know this, and this is exactly what they're preying on. The second problem is that they treat brain health as if it's totally separate from other aspects of your health. This includes your physical health, your emotional health, your social health, and your spiritual health. The brain cannot be decontextualized from the rest of your being. It's all integrated, it's all part of you. So to really get at brain health, we really have to address all different aspects of health and well being. The third problem is that it really offers a one size fits all or a one app 
fits all type of solution. This is just not realistic at all. The brain is immensely complicated. We all know this. So how could it possibly be that one little pill that you take every day or working on an app 30 minutes a day, how could that possibly affect such a complex biological system as the brain? The true solution to brain health is going to have to be multifaceted. It's just not realistic to think that you're going to get a big result from something so small. The fourth point is that all of the smart drugs that are marketed for better brain health have no scientific basis whatsoever. If there was one that actually proved itself, I guarantee you that a pharmaceutical company would be selling it to you and you wouldn't be able to get it in your local convenience store. This one really bothers me as a practicing neuropsychologist because I see so many of my patients coming in every day to my office telling me that they're spending hundreds of dollars a month buying all sorts of supplements that have absolutely no scientific basis whatsoever. The fifth one is really important for older adults because the brain fitness industry as it is right now does not value the impact of social health. Think of how many things that are sold for brain health are actually activities that you're meant to do alone in your house. This goes for all the brain games. This goes for the apps, the brain training games, all of them are marketed to you to do alone in your house. That is fundamentally incorrect with the way brain scientists think about the brain. We know that the impact of social health is absolutely critical. Do you remember many years ago when they came out with the big finding that crossword puzzles really improve brain health and maybe they could even ward off dementia? Well, those studies that were done were done in the context of community centers. And what they found when they redid the studies but had the individuals do the brain training, the crossword puzzles at home, is that they totally lost the effect. And so what we can infer from that is that it was actually the social gathering, the interpersonal interaction that was really providing the therapeutic brain value. The sixth problem is a lack of objectivity in who is delivering these messages. When your primary objective is to sell someone a pill, to sell someone a magic cure, what do we really think about what's motivating them? Is it truly to enlighten someone about brain health or is it to make a buck? I wonder if you know this, in 2014, 73 neuroscientists and psychologists got together and wrote an open letter to the brain fitness industry in which they told them flat out, you are making exaggerated claims and we are very worried that this is a public health crisis. The main point of their letter was to say that all of their claims are not based on sound scientific information. They ended their letter by saying, our biggest concern is that older adults are making choices about how to spend their time, how to spend their money, and they're getting no return back on their investment. The final sentence of their letter said, this is a serious concern and it can really feel that people are getting exploited. So the question has to be asked, why has this eight to $10 billion brain fitness industry taken hold? Well, first of all, we're living a lot longer than we ever did. Nowadays, it's really common for people to get into their 80s and 90s. What happens when people live longer is that we're going to see more incidents of dementia. You've probably heard of the silver tsunami, the wave of dementia that we're expecting to take over the world. This brings with it a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear. As I told you earlier, dementia is the number one fear of older adults. And when you have a group of people who are misinformed and are very, very afraid, they are ripe for the taking. They're all ready for your sales pitch and they're gonna dish out that money because they are petrified and they don't know what else to do. The second reason I think this industry has taken hold is that there's been fascinating and truly impressive advances in the field of neuroplasticity. We know from animal studies and even human studies that animals, including us, in an enriched environment have the ability to change our brain. By changes in our environment, we have the power to make our brain stronger, to make our brain more resistant to the effects of brain disease. This excitement about our power to change the brain is absolutely on target. The problem is the methods that are currently being used are wrong. So I wanna let you in on the secret that all brain scientists know. The only true way to achieve brain health is going to be by behaviors driven by you. You have to get involved. It's not going to come to you in a pill. It's not going to come to you from playing games. There are many, many things that you need to be doing to truly achieve brain health. 
The problem that we have with the brain fitness industry as it stands now is you don't have a trusted resource to give you this information. A large part of what I'm gonna be teaching you in the I Care for the Brain program is to understand the relationship between lowering your personal risk factors for brain-related changes with age and increasing something called cognitive reserve. Successful aging largely depends on the interactions between our genes, the DNA that we're born with, and our environment. Nearly all diseases, including those related to the brain, are due to a complex interaction of having a predisposition genetically to a certain disease and something in the environment activates that gene. There are big differences in the ages at which brain-related changes happen, suggesting that it's not just an aging process. There are many things that happen above and beyond normal aging that you have total and complete control over. You just need to know what these are. A broader conception of brain health is desperately needed, one that goes beyond the simplistic approach of the current marketplace, one that puts older adults in charge of their own brain health. One thing that really inspired me to do this program is the vast gap that currently exists between what brain scientists know about the brain and what is communicated to the general public. When I was in graduate school and finishing up my training, I was absolutely amazed every single day at the things that I was reading in brain health journals. I would then go do my clinical hours and meet with actual people, and it was amazing to me how little of this information was generally known. That experience really shaped the kind of neuropsychologist that I am. The way I work in my practice is very educationally based, and the feedback that I've gotten from older adults is that they love it. They want to know more. They don't want to get the snippets that are in the magazines. They don't want to hear about brain health from commercials trying to sell them a product. They want to know and deserve to know a comprehensive background on what is going on with this really important part of themselves. In 2015, I developed the I Care for Your Brain program to specifically address this gap in how brain scientists think and what is communicated to the general public. The ingredients that go into my program are science, objectivity, power, and choice. So now let me answer the question that you've been dying to know. What is the solution? What is the I Care for Your Brain program? I Care for Your Brain is a scientifically based education program empowering adults and people that care about them with engaging, easy to follow information that is motivating for action. The philosophy underlying my program is kind of counterintuitive when you think about brain health, but I really want you to start thinking about it this way if you're gonna get somewhere. Your brain is not the whole story. Successful cognitive aging has to be based in a multi-dimensional approach that yes, respects brain health, but also respects physical health, social health, and spiritual health. And maybe most importantly, a vital engagement with life. So I think a totally normal question to be asking yourself at this point is, okay, sounds good, but why should I listen to this woman? Well, let me take a couple minutes of your time to just tell you a little bit more about me. So I feel very fortunate to know what I think I'm best at from a pretty young age. When I was around 15 years old, my grandmother started showing signs of Alzheimer's disease. Through that journey with her, I was very profoundly moved about the effect of brain diseases on individuals, on them as people. From the time I was 15 until I started college at 21, I worked in a variety of settings with older adults very happily in different types of nursing facilities as an activities director, uh, part of an adult day health program as a therapeutic companion and a caregiver. When I started college, I knew that I was interested in some type of helping profession, but it wasn't until I took a class on physiological psychology that it hit me that I could be a brain scientist. Fast forward a couple years down the road, I've got my PhD from Boston University, finished up my training at the Boston VA and Harvard Medical School, had an assistant professorship at UNC Chapel Hill School of Medicine, and have started my own private practice. The thing that I've always liked throughout all my education and training is the helping part. I'm very, very excited to be sharing my expertise with you in this program. My thought is that you have a right to know as much as I do, as much as other brain scientists do, about what's happening to your brain. So how does the I Care for Your Brain program work? So let me get into the nitty gritty of what it is I'm offering you. So it's a science-based curriculum that's delivered in nine lectures. 
Each of the nine lectures has two components. The first half of the lecture is always getting you on board with a solid scientific base about the topic. The second part of the lecture, we transition into the recommendations. This is where you take the wheel. You are going to understand by the end of every lecture exactly what it is that brain scientists know will truly help that aspect of your health. Remember what I said before about social health, that a huge part of brain health is remaining connected with other people? Well, that's part of what we're gonna also try to build online together. We have a Facebook group that is really vibrant where adults gather to ask me questions, to interface with each other. Everyone is there with the same goal. They want high quality information about the brain and they wanna know exactly what it is that they're supposed to be doing. So let's go through the curriculum briefly and see if this interests you. The first lecture that I'm gonna offer you is understanding the aging brain. I'm gonna help you understand the complexities of neuroscience in a way that you're really going to get. We're gonna talk about when to be worried, what's normal in the brain, what is dementia, what's the difference between normal aging and dementia. Really give you a solid educational base to process and understand the rest of the curriculum. In lecture number two, we're gonna talk about how to minimize your risk factors for dementia throughout the lifespan. It's really not something that should matter to you once you cross that threshold of 65. Believe it or not, there are actually in utero risk factors that will affect people as they get into older adulthood. I want you to understand from conception all the way up to older, older adulthood, 90 years old, what are the specific risk factors? And most importantly, what is it that you can be doing right now to minimize those risk factors for yourself or somebody that you care about? In lecture number three, we're gonna be talking about heart health and how that intimately relates to brain health. This is another perfect example of how it's really not scientifically correct for us to take the brain health away from other aspects of health. The heart and the brain have a very intimate and very important relationship. Many adults get diagnosed with things like high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and high cholesterol. These diagnoses have a very significant impact on brain health, and you need to know exactly what the steps are that you can be taking to minimize the damage from those conditions on your brain. Lecture number four is a very popular one. How do substances affect the aging brain? What we're gonna talk about there is all the way from diet, to supplements, to prescription drugs, to alcohol. How are these things processed uniquely by the older adult. In lecture number five, we're gonna talk about the psychology of aging. We cannot talk about brain health and separate it from how we feel as people who are aging and who are going through different phases of life. The lecture is going to specifically focus on the effects of stress on the body and specifically the brain. I'm gonna teach you coping skills that are going to dramatically improve the way that you handle stress, and that will improve the health of your brain, absolutely. In lecture number six, we're gonna talk about that importance of social connection. You've heard that phrase, it takes a village. It really, really does take a village as we start to get a little bit older. We need people around us that love us, that are concerned about us, but sometimes those people don't know what to do. What I wanna do in this lecture is explain to older adults, but also the people that care about them, exactly what is it that they need in terms of social health? What are the things that people should be doing that will genuinely make an impact in the quality of someone's life, including their brain health? So in lecture seven, we are going to get to memory and what are some evidence-based tips for you to truly improve your memory? And guess what? It's not gonna come in a pill and it's not gonna come in an app. There are many, many things that brain scientists know truly improve your memory and I'm going to teach them all to you. Lecture eight is a really, really important topic. This is about how sleep changes as we get older. If you're listening to this and you're over 50, you know that your sleep is changing. What my patients tell me is that as you get older, you do not sleep as well and you tend to get up a little bit more early in the morning Never mind the multiple trips to the bathroom throughout the night. So what I'm gonna teach you is why is this happening? There is a scientific basis for it. There's a lot of different things that you can be doing that will genuinely improve the quality of your sleep. And the reason why this is so important is because sleep is absolutely vital to the health of our immune system, to our mood, 
and to the way that our brain processes and remembers information. In the ninth lecture, what we're gonna do is recap everything to really reinforce those most important teaching points so you feel like you end the program truly thinking like a brain scientist, knowing exactly what to do. So now that I've gotten you on board with the content of our lectures, let me just tell you a little bit more about how we're going to turn learning into action. Because after all, that's really what this program is about. I wanna help you get on board with really high quality knowledge and information about the brain. But if we don't do anything with it, what does it really matter? What I really care about is teaching you how to flip the switch and take control of your brain health all on your own. So one of the ways that we're gonna do this is by offering you a companion workbook that goes along with every lecture. Let me tell you a little bit about what's gonna be in this workbook. So what we have are all of the presentation slides that I base my lecture on. Next to every slide, what you're gonna have is a note-taking section because I want you to be actively involved with this information. One of the best ways that we learn is by hearing it and writing it. So I really want you to be taking notes, really acting as if we are in a university setting and I'm the professor and you're the eager student and we are working together, collaborating together to learn this amazing new information. The other thing that the workbook is gonna have is tools to help you put this information into action. There's behavior tracking sheets, there's motivating support to really help you understand how to follow through with these recommendations. So I want you to use this companion workbook as a way of making the I Care For Your Brain program personalized. This is a place for you to record how what I talk about is relevant to you specifically or someone you care about specifically. I want you to use it as a resource guide far into the future that you can come back to time and time again when you're curious or concerned about a specific problem. So in 2016, after a year of research and collaboration, I debuted the I Care For Your Brain program at Peanut Village, a life plan community in Southern Pines, North Carolina. And it was an amazing experience. Every time we offered a lecture to the community, more and more people started coming to the point where we didn't have enough chairs to fit all the people that wanted to learn about the brain. To date, we've had over 1,500 adults participate in the program. What was really important to me is how I was doing using four benchmarks of success. The four markers of success that mattered most to me was, was I educating people? Were people feeling engaged with the material? Was it having a true impact in their quality of life and what they did every day? And were they feeling more empowered and in control of their brain health? During the first lecture, we polled people before and after the lecture, and we asked them, do you understand what the term dementia means? Prior to the lecture, about 44% of people told us that they either knew what it meant or they thought they knew what it meant. After the lecture, we polled these folks again and we got that number up to 83% of people feeling really confident that they knew what that term dementia meant. We also asked people, do you understand really how your genes and your lifestyle choices come together to raise your risk of dementia? Before the lecture, about 39% of people said they felt like they had a good understanding. I'm really proud to say that afterwards, 90% of those same people felt that they could readily explain it to a friend. When we asked the participants in the program if they enjoyed it and what they thought the quality of the lectures were, 100% of people rated it excellent to very good. 94% of people said that they would return for another program. 95% of the people who attended told me that they felt that the program really impacted positively on the community. And 99% of people told me that they felt more empowered to talk to their medical providers about their brain than they did before the lecture series. About 89% of people who attended said that they were talking about brain health with their friends and family. And maybe most important to me was this last set of data in which I asked people if they felt more empowered as a part of participating in the I Care For Your Brain program. 94% of people told me that they felt that they were a more critical consumer of brain health news as a result of participating in the program. 94% of adults said that they felt that they were less likely to be taken advantage of by claims from the brain fitness industry on products and supplements that are supposed to help their brain. 
One of the most rewarding parts about doing this program is hearing back from people how it's impacted them. And people have been so gracious to come up to me after and tell me that it's truly made a difference in their overall well-being, that they feel so much more confident about this part of their health and that they were genuinely curious, they just didn't know who to believe. So why am I here with you today? Because the reach that I have by doing this program in person is somewhat limited, I really wanna reach as many of you that are out there that want to know this information. So I'm bringing the I Care For Your Brain program to the online world. So I think I can ask you, where do you wanna get your brain health information from? Would you prefer to get it from a brain scientist or a corporate marketing exec? There are some differences in how we're going to approach brain health. On my side, Everything that I talk about is based on research. I strive to be objective and to keep the hype really, really low. The recommendations that I'm gonna teach you have been proven to work in scientific settings, and the vast majority of them are free or little to no cost. I wanna empower you through education. My concern is that corporate execs who are trying to sell you a product might not be based on some of these similar values. As I've shared with you, my idea is that I really think that that industry is built on fear. It's very product oriented. There's a lot of scare tactics that are used. And I can promise you that there is no return on your investment with the vast majority of brain health products that are on the market today. So after this lecture, if this feels like something that's interesting to you, something that's exciting to you, something that you think could really work, something that puts you in the driver's seat, please join me on my online community. It would truly be my privilege to help you think like a brain scientist. Sullivan, welcome to the first lecture in the I Care For Your Brain series. I'm really, really pleased that you're here with me today and I promise I'm gonna teach you everything that I know today about the aging brain. The first thing I wanna do is define successful aging. Then we have to understand some basic aspects of the brain to understand some of the later concepts. We're gonna talk in detail about structural and functional changes that happens in the brain. And what that means is we wanna know what happens at the cellular level, but also what changes in terms of our everyday lives. The last thing that we're gonna talk about is dementia. What exactly does that term mean when people talk about it? And what are all the different types of dementia? We're gonna close up by talking about what you should do to get a gold standard evaluation of the brain if that's something that you're worried about for you or a loved one. When we think about the seven elements of successful aging, I wonder what it is that comes up in your mind. For me, I think that these are the critical pieces. The first one is a low level of physical disability. Of course, as we get older, we know that we do get a little bit slower and it can be hard to move around sometimes. But the idea is we wanna keep this to the most minimum level possible. The next one is maximum independence. I think that this is important to all of us and maybe even more so as we get older. Of course, intact cognitive functioning is the reason that we're here together today. We all wanna be operating from the best, most healthiest brain possible. The next one is active engagement in life. We all wanna be vitally involved with activities that are meaningful to us. The fifth one is social and spiritual connectedness. We are social beings. We need to be around other people. Now, the degree to which we need to be around other people is really different for all of us, but essentially we know that we all do need each other. The fifth one is positive life review. As we get older, it's really important to look back on our lives and feel that we lived a life full of value, that we're really proud of, that we left some type of positive legacy behind. And the final one is self-determination. And that's really a big part of what I'm doing with the I Care For Your Brain program. I really wanna put you in the driver's seat of your own brain health. It's very important that we make our own decisions and that we exert as much 
much power and control as we can about modifiable aspects of our health. And what I mean by that are what are the things that you can actually control on your own? Successful aging depends so much on the interaction between our genes and our lifestyle choices. This is really the case for all aspects of physical and mental health, and brain health is no exception. The secret that brain scientists know is that only you can truly determine the health of your brain. True brain health involves behaviors that have to be initiated by you. You just need to know what to do. What we're gonna be focusing on in this lecture series is the sweet spot between lowering the modifiable risk factors that you can actually change and increasing what we call your cognitive reserve. And I'm gonna explain both of those concepts in really good detail. So there's two types of risk factors when you think of brain health. There's non-modifiable, which just means the things that you can't change. And there's modifiable, which are the things that you can change. What I want you to pay attention to here is the fact that the list in the non-modifiable group is very, very small. Really the only two things that influence brain health as we change that we have no control over whatsoever are specific gene mutations and our age. Age is the number one factor for dementia as we get older. It doesn't mean that you're invariably going to get dementia as you get older. Sure, the older you get, the more you are at risk for getting it, but it does not mean that dementia is a normal part of aging. On the other hand, we have modifiable risk factors. These are the things that you can do something about. And this is really the backbone of the I Care For Your Brain program. I wanna teach you how these risk factors specifically affect brain health. And I wanna teach you what it is that you can do to scientifically try to outsmart these risk factors. So let's just go through these one by one. And as you're listening, I want you to think about yourself or somebody that you care about and do we think that maybe they are at increased risk for less than optimal brain health because they have some of these risk factors? The first group have to do with our cardiovascular health. High blood pressure, also called hypertension, is probably the number one risk factor for reduced blood and oxygen getting to the brain. In one of our later lectures, we're gonna talk all about how heart health equals brain health, and anyone who's affected by any of the top three cardiovascular risk factors, which are high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and type two diabetes, I really want you to tune into that one because there's some really important information that you need to know. So getting through our modifiable list, we have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, type two diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, but only when it's not treated, repeat head injury, um, one or two concussions is typically not something to worry about, but when we get into people having four, five, six, that is when we do get a bit concerned. Untreated sensory loss, so this is hearing loss or vision loss that is not adequately treated. So many of you might know people who don't like to wear those hearing aids every day. That's exactly what I'm talking about. One other modifiable risk factor is too much alcohol. And what's important to know about that is that our body's ability to metabolize alcohol really does change with age. But if we don't know that, we might keep throwing back the drinks like it's still 20, 30 years ago. Smoking also presents a significant impact on all aspects of physical health and of course brain health poor diet, social isolation, and low mental stimulation. These are the things that brain scientists know truly impact brain health. You just need to know more specifics and what to do about it. I wanna to talk to you about this concept of cognitive reserve. It's actually really, really interesting and critically important if you're going to understand brain health. This idea of cognitive reserve was pushed forward by a scientist from New York called Dr. Stern. And he became really interested in the concept after looking at some data of people who had passed away and had their brains donated to science. What he figured out was that about 25% of these people's brains had clinically diagnosable Alzheimer's disease. They had the pathological plaques and tangles that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. But here's the catch. None of these people demonstrated Alzheimer's disease while living. So it led to this really important discussion in brain science, this was about maybe 15, 20 years ago, to come up with an explanation for this. Why was this the case? And he set forth the idea of cognitive reserve. And so much of what is marketed to you in terms of brain fitness is based on this concept, but the methods are not exactly right. So let me tell you just a little bit more about it. So the idea is that 
Our lifetime of experiences, specifically those that happen at a younger age, our education, our job experiences, our interpersonal relationships, that they create stronger brain networks that over time as we get older, can combat the effects of brain disease more and more. So what that means is two different people could have the same level of Alzheimer's disease in their brain, and one may show symptoms and one may not. Now, of course, it's not that easy. We also have to think about the genetic burden that each person holds. And all that that means is we inherit a certain percentage, a certain likelihood of developing a type of dementia over time, and it's something in the environment that turns on those genes. Just to put it in simplistic terms, if somebody has an 80% chance likelihood of developing dementia, probably very little has to happen in their life to make those genes active and to make that person develop dementia. On the other hand, if someone only has a 10% genetic risk, it's gonna take a lot more risk factor in the environment, a lot more of those modifiable risk factors to actually result in having the disease in everyday life. So what Stern's theory is, and I think that it's absolutely true, is that the more you put into your brain bank, this is the idea of the cognitive reserve, the more withdrawals can happen as a result of brain disease until you go into the red, until you feel that effect. So why is this important? This is the essence of all the brain training products on the market, use it or lose it, let's make that brain stronger. The problem is the methods that are being offered to you are really not based in science. We know that there are certain principles of neuroplasticity that you need to abide by in order to get that effect. And the vast majority of products on the market today just don't follow those rules. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the brain. What is this amazing three pound organ that we have in our heads? I think most people understand that there are different lobes in the brain, right? We have our frontal lobes, we have our temporal lobes, we have our parietal lobes back here, and far in the back we have our occipital lobes. Many years ago we used to believe that the brain's regions acted separately and were very, very specialized for different types of information. While there's some degree of truth in this, what we really know now is that the brain is an incredibly interconnected communication system. Another aspect of the brain that doesn't get nearly the press as all the different lobes get, but is maybe even more important, is the distinction between our gray matter and our white matter. So I wanna teach you about the white matter and the gray matter, cause it's absolutely fascinating. And also it's really important that you understand these two things, because depending on different things that happen in the brain as we age, you're gonna see changes in these two different parts of the brain. So let's just talk a little bit about the gray matter since we're more familiar with that typically. This is the outside of the brain, the cortex. And like I said, it makes up about 40% of the brain. This is where our information is stored. This is where information lives. If you think about the concept of a librarian looking for her books, her books are stored in the gray matter. The white matter, in contrast, makes up about 60% of our brain, and this is actually the librarian going out and trying to find her books. Now, some of you might know, as you get a little bit older, the information that you're searching for, let's say acquaintance's name or the name of a famous movie actor, you know you know the name, but you just can't find it. This is a perfect example of the librarian is getting a little bit slower, but once she finds her book, she knows exactly that that was the book that she was looking for. In our brain, we have over a hundred billion neurons. Let's just talk a little bit about the different pieces of the neurons, because again, I really want you to understand the specifics of what we're gonna be talking about in this program. If you're familiar with biology, you know that all cells in the body have a nucleus. That nucleus and the little tiny arms or dendrites that extend from the nucleus are stored in the gray matter. The tail or the axon of the cell is the white matter. And different chemical signals pass in and out of these cells which tell them to either do something or to not do something. A lot of what happens in the brain can be thought of through the metaphor of a gas pedal and a brake pedal. Different parts of the brain tell us, go ahead, do that, it's good, go for it. Other parts of the brain tell us, hold on, pump the brakes, you need a minute here. The brain is a very intricate, complicated interplay between red lights and green lights. So what is the main fuel for the brain? 
This is a critical concept. You absolutely have to understand how important oxygen and glucose are for the brain. Now, even though the brain only makes up about 2% of our overall body weight, it uses much more of our body's proportion of oxygen and glucose. When I say glucose, what I mean is blood sugar. So the brain needs about 20% of the overall oxygen in the body and about 50% of all the glucose in the body. Now here's what's critical, is the brain cannot hold on to any of these fuels. It cannot adequately store enough supplies of these fuels. So it needs to be constantly replenished. It needs to always have access to an adequate amount of oxygen and glucose in order to properly work. The fuel delivery system for the brain is blood. So we need to understand how is it that the blood is moving throughout the brain and there's two primary systems. We've got two sets of pretty big blood vessels that go into the brain. What we have in the front is our carotid arteries. You probably heard about those. But then we have an equally sized set in the back called the vertebral arteries. And what these arteries do is provide the biggest amount of blood that enters into the brain. These two sets of blood vessels come together in the middle of the brain and make a circle. This is called the circle of Willis. And what is so cool about this is it's really a backup system. So that way, if there is a breakdown or a block in any one of the main blood vessels, different parts of the brain can be supplied by other inroads to get that blood and oxygen into parts of the brain. But this doesn't apply to the entire brain, and this might be the most critical concept for you to understand normal brain aging. In the middle part of the brain, remember that white matter, the subcortical part of the brain? There's a whole nother system of blood vessels, and these don't have any collateral support. They don't have any friends who are gonna kick in and give over a blood supply if their runs out. These are a series of little tiny blood vessels, tinier than even a high quality microscope can see, that are so, so, so small that they're very vulnerable to things like high blood pressure and dramatic changes in blood sugar levels. And what happens to many folks as they get older is that due to different medical conditions that are modifiable, we get irreversible damage in this part of the brain. And how this shows up for most people is if they get an MRI or a CT scan of the brain, they're typically told something like, well, you have a couple white spots in your brain, or we see a little small vessel disease. This type of brain change goes by many different names. Probably the most uh, common name that you're going to hear is chronic ischemic small vessel disease. And all that that means is the little tiny blood vessels in your brain have either broken off from the pressure of high blood pressure or have filled up with cholesterol to the point where blood can no longer get through. How this is gonna manifest in your everyday life is with those annoying retrieval problems that come along with aging. And part of this is because this is so common, particularly in Western culture, where we have a very rich diet in saturated fats. This is the brain problem that is absolutely related to you not being able to come up with those words that you know darn well that you know, but they just don't come up as quick as you want. It's very, very likely related to this problem. So this is a perfect example of why we wanna get adults thinking about brain health earlier and earlier. We don't wanna wait until someone is in their 80s and 90s to start thinking about what is it we can do to preserve our brain. It's never too late to start, but the truth is you have your most power to affect the health of your brain the earlier you start. So let's talk about some normal changes that happen in the brain with age. There are really big differences in the range of ages at which people experience brain changes, which really suggests that it's not just age, there's something else that's going on. What we know is that younger, older folks, so 50 to 60, 60 to 70, they are doing better on average in terms of physical health and brain health. And what we attribute this to is advances in physical medicine. We are more health conscious these days. We know so much more about how to keep our bodies, specifically our cardiovascular health, stronger, and that has such a powerful effect on the brain. Also, people have had more access to things like education and the ability to participate in complex hobbies. And that's really what scientists think is the difference in the age changes that we see in brain health over time. 
Now, most people will experience some minor changes with age in the way that they process and retrieve information. But what I wanna convince you about today is that this really needs to stay in the mild range before someone gets worried. By the time we're 80, we are gonna be getting a little bit more changes in the way we think about things, the way we learn, the way we remember, but it really should not rise to the level of impacting your everyday life. And when we get to that part of the lecture, I'm really excited to teach you all that I know about dementia and what that, that actually means. Many of the changes that happen above and beyond normal aging are related to these modifiable risk factors. So one thing that's really important as we talk about the brain is I want you to understand the difference between structure and function, and this is a key concept. There are normal changes that happen in brain structure, and there's also normal changes that happen in the way the brain works. There isn't necessarily a significant relationship between these two things. You might think that the health of the brain as you see it physically would dictate the way that it works in real life, but that's not actually the case. So what we know from different brain imaging studies is that there are physiological or structural changes that happen with age. So let's just talk about those for a little bit. The first thing that happens that is totally normal is that we do lose a little bit of our brain volume. And this is typically more of the white white matter than it is the gray matter. So what does that mean? That means that we're gonna get a little bit more slowness in our retrieval. The information is still in there, it's just sometimes a little bit harder to find. The other thing that happens is we lose connections between the cells. And this is probably due to a little bit of a decrease in our overall brain chemistry. We also know that less blood and oxygen travels to the brain as we get older, and it's probably related to the blood vessels becoming a little bit narrower due to the cardiovascular issues that I talked about earlier. The final change that we know happens normally in most people's brain as they get older is they actually have more inflammation in their brain. And this is probably due to two things that we're gonna talk about in this series, diet and stress. There's also normal changes that happen in the way the brain functions. So how does the brain actually work in real life? Now this is an interesting area of research because there is a group of researchers that feel that everything is related to a decline in vision and hearing. Now they think that if we could just compensate for normal vision and hearing loss, everything else that goes wrong in the brain as we get older, those mild changes, would really be completely normalized. Other brain scientists feel that that's probably not as accurate, and what they see as changing most significantly are things like your processing speed, your ability to find those words, specifically names, your ability to multitask, and your ability to learn new information over time. But don't go getting depressed, because what I really want you to hear is that these changes, when they're normal, are very, very mild. Let's talk about these changes in a little bit more detail. The vision changes are very, very common. You can see I'm wearing glasses. I've been wearing them since the second grade. As I look out into the crowds at my talks, I would say about 90, 95% of older folks are wearing glasses. So the first thing that we know is that acuity, which means our ability to perceive small texts and fonts, changes over time. We have more and more difficulty focusing up close. We also know that our peripheral vision does decrease a little bit. We know that there are structural changes in the lenses and the pupil and the retina. And of course we have age-related vision disorders like cataracts, macular degeneration, glaucoma, and even structural changes like eyelid skin falling down over the eye, making it difficult to see. Hearing loss is another common change that happens with age. By the time we're 75 years old, over half of us are going to have clinically diagnosable hearing loss. And what is so important about this is that if we don't hear what someone said, we're not giving our brain any information to work on. The other thing that you need to know about untreated hearing loss, so these are people who either don't have hearing aids or have them and are not exactly wearing them as they should. There's some new research that's come out that's very, very important that you know. And what it's told us is that when people don't have their hearing loss treated, that creates a risk factor for dementia in a couple years down the road. And the idea is that if those 
brain cells in the auditory cortex, the hearing part of our brain, are not getting stimulated, they don't think they have any work to do and they shrivel up and die. Once the process of cell death has initiated in the brain, it can sometimes be the beginning of a downward spiral. I think if more people knew this, it would create a lot more motivation for people to actually wear their hearing aids, to say nothing of the irritation that it can also cause people's spouses by having to repeat themselves over and over again. The other thing I want you to know about hearing loss is that it is critically important to social health. When people can't hear, people stop talking to them. They stop participating in activities. And what we see is that their social world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. One of the things I wanna convince you of in my brain series is the critical importance of social health. This is not okay that we get less social and less connected as we get older. It's actually a time in our lives where we need to be more vitally engaged with with each other. And if you have hearing loss that's not treated, you're absolutely not gonna be as connected as you should be. The ability to process information quickly and multitask does mildly decline with age. And this is related to that subcortical part of the brain that I taught you about earlier. Remember those little teeny tiny blood vessels that are so fragile, they're so vulnerable to high blood pressure and high cholesterol? If you know anyone or you yourself has one of those medical conditions, I almost guarantee you, you also have other cardiovascular conditions. They tend to travel together. Most people start off with a little bit of high cholesterol, then the hypertension, the high blood pressure develops to compensate for that. And over time, this can lead to less blood flow to different parts of the brain. Different parts of the body have different diameters of blood vessels. I think it makes sense to all of us that the smaller the diameter of the blood vessel, the easier it's going to be to sustain damage. So where in the body do we find the smallest blood vessels? They're in the feet, the kidneys, the eyes, and the brain. And if you think about something like type 2 diabetes, that's where we see a lot of the consequences. We have neuropathy that starts in the feet, that burning and itchy and achy feeling. We get kidney disease. We have retinal neuropathy. We have brain changes. So that's a critical example of sometimes when people think of type 2 diabetes, they just think of it as a blood sugar problem, but it's absolutely a brain health problem. So the last thing we're gonna talk about in this section is that learning does get a little bit more difficult. And why we think this is, is that in the normally aging brain, the memory centers called the hippocampus do shrink a little bit more than the rest of the brain with age. This absolutely does not mean that older adults are not able to learn. It just means that they need to hear information repeated numerous times until it sinks in. So we are not going to be negative about aging in this series. I absolutely think that brain aging can happen very successfully. So let's talk about what doesn't change with age. Older adults have extensive life experience on which to draw. So absolutely things like wisdom and crystallized knowledge just keep increasing the longer and longer someone lives. We know that judgment and verbal reasoning absolutely remain exactly as they were before in the normally aging person's brain. Our ability to pay attention to things that we're interested remains the same and our social cognition increases. Now this is a super interesting area. This means we get better and better at dealing with people as we get older. When we talk about brain health, I want you to understand it across the whole spectrum from absolutely normal aging all the way through the different diseases that cause dementia. When we look across the spectrum, I want you to think about it in three different categories. The first one is normal aging. The next one is something that we call mild cognitive impairment, and the next one is dementia. And I'm gonna explain each one of these in really good detail. Let's talk about mild cognitive impairment. This is actually a somewhat controversial diagnosis. Mild cognitive impairment is considered to be a cognitive disorder in which aspects of thinking are worse than we would expect for age, but they're not at the point where they affect everyday life. That's the crossroads into dementia. Once a cognitive problem like learning or memory or a language problem crosses over into affecting everyday life, that's when we consider it to be dementia. So to meet criteria for a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, you have to go through a process called neuropsychological testing. And that is what people like me as neuropsychologists do for a living. We give standardized tests, 
in-depth clinical interviews and a review of medical records to figure out exactly what is going on with someone's brain. Mild cognitive impairment is a diagnosis that I might use if someone who's come to see me in my clinic has a memory problem that's about 1.5 standard deviations from the mean. And what that means is that they're definitely a little bit lower than I would like to see them for their age, but they're not so low that I know that they're having problems remembering to take their medicines, driving, or managing their money. So why this diagnosis is somewhat controversial is because brain scientists are not decided on what it actually means and where people who have this diagnosis are going to wind up. So some people believe that mild cognitive impairment is a stable problem, meaning you drop down a little bit from age, but you're going to stay there. It's not a progressive condition. There's other groups of scientists that think that what we're actually capturing is the very early stages of a brain condition like Alzheimer's disease. The way to really get around this is to have someone tested at two time points at least nine to 12 months apart so you can really judge if there's been an objective change in their brain functioning over time. Dementia is not a normal part of aging. This is a huge misconception, and we all remember some of the names that people used to use. Old timers disease, hardening of the arteries. What's inherent in some of those names is this idea that it's inevitable, that if you live long enough, you're going to develop dementia, and that's just not true. As I told you before, age is the number one risk factor for developing dementia, but there are plenty of people out there who are 105 who have no signs of dementia whatsoever, so it's absolutely not a normal part of aging. I just told you a few minutes ago that the definition of dementia is when cognitive problems are to the degree that they have difficulty doing things in everyday life without assistance. And what's critical is that this is a change for the person. If this is someone who always had a hard time balancing the checkbook, uh, you, you can't get overly worried about them. It has to be that it was something they used to be able to do and now they're having difficulty. The number one question I get as a neuropsychologist is what is the difference between dementia and something like Alzheimer's disease? I want you to think about dementia as an umbrella term, okay? It's a very broad construct. And underneath the umbrella, there's 90 different types of brain diseases that cause dementia. All dementias are due to different diseases in the brain that cause injury or death to the cells in the brain or their ability to communicate with one another. When you think about dementia, I want you to know that it's not just a cognitive problem. It's really easy to just chalk it up to, well, someone can't remember as well as they used to, or this one can't remember names like she used to. Dementia really has three parts, and until we understand these three parts, we're not gonna be able to give the care that people with dementia deserve. Of course, there is a cognitive component. For most people with dementia, the first sign that we see is difficulty with new learning. The next problem is difficulty with things like multitasking and reasoning. Someone who used to be able to do all sorts of things seems to be having trouble keeping all those balls in the air. Language is another aspect that's often hit with dementia, and what you see is difficulty finding words and difficulty comprehending. But the symptoms of dementia are so much more than just cognitive. There's always a mood or behavior component, and there's also what we call a functional or an everyday component. The mood or behavior changes can actually happen even before the memory changes. And what we typically see is an increase in frustration, irritability, and part of this is because something is new and different and more difficult in a way than it was for someone's whole life, but it is also related to just the biology of the changes that are happening in the brain. A very common thing that can happen for individuals with dementia very early on is a decrease in interest or their ability to engage in their hobbies. And sometimes, like I said, this can even predate the memory symptoms. The third part of dementia is that everyday life piece, and I've said this a few times now. The cognitive symptoms have to be at the level that they interfere with people's instrumental activities of daily living, and those are considered to be three different sets of skills. Driving, medication management, and finances. The most complicated of those three, by far, is finances. 
If somebody can manage a checkbook, balance a checkbook, and be handling investments and bills, there is no way that they can meet criteria for dementia. Brain scientists disagree on the most common form of dementia. Typically, we think about Alzheimer's disease, but if we're just going by strict autopsy studies, what is probably more realistic is that many people with dementia have what we call a mixed dementia, meaning that they have a few different types of dementia that are combining together to give that person their unique symptoms. You've probably heard of some other types of dementia, vascular dementia, is due to people having one or more significant strokes. Some people with Parkinson's disease develop dementia. There's something called Lewy body dementia, which is actually very common, but very underdiagnosed. And there's about 80 or 90 other types of dementia. This is why neuropsychologists feel so strongly about people undergoing our assessments, because really it's only the tools that we use that can figure out what type of dementia someone has. Until you know exactly what the problem is, you don't really know what you're treating. So we need to get the map very clear on the contributions to the dementia, the type of dementia, and then we're gonna be in a much better position to do something realistically helpful about it. So let me give you some examples of what's normal and when to worry. If you're finding yourself or you're noticing in a loved one or maybe even a resident, they're putting sticky notes all over the place to try to remember, that in and of itself is actually fine. The problem becomes when the sticky notes become a city unto themselves and actually create more confusion to remembering than they do help. If you sometimes have that tip of the tongue phenomenon or you notice that in a parent, but in a few minutes the information pops back into someone's mind, that for the most part is pretty normal. Needing to reduce distractions to focus on a task is very normal as we get older. You might have been able to balance the checkbook 10 years ago with the TV on, maybe even taking an occasional phone call. You might find now that you really need to keep distractions to a minimum in order to do the task quickly and accurately. In contrast, I want you to think a little bit more seriously and maybe get a little bit concerned if these things start happening to you or somebody that you care about. If somebody mentions something to you and you have absolutely no memory of having had that experience, even after they give you cues and prompts, that is pretty concerning because when we forget whole experiences, that is usually a sign that there's something abnormal going on in the brain. If you ever have feelings of being confused or ever feel like you see that in someone that you care about, that's typically not normal. Sometimes when people are first coming out of sleep or if they've been in the hospital or they've had a surgery, a little bit of transient confusion can be okay, but if the person is clearly disoriented and has difficulty figuring out what's going on, that is something to be concerned about. I also want you to raise your level of concern if you have a strong family history of dementia. The younger someone is when they develop symptoms of dementia, the more likely it is to be genetic. There's a big difference in having a family member who started showing signs of Alzheimer's disease at 55 or 60 than there is in someone who started showing signs at 80 or 85. The older we are when we get dementia, the more likely it is due to these modifiable risk factors. That's kind of an indirect way of being able to judge how strong is your genetic load. What is the genetic likelihood of you developing dementia as you get older? And remember, the most important thing to keep an eye on is everyday life. If you or someone you care about starts to have difficulty getting from point A to point B in the car, getting lost, not remembering to take medications, double taking medications, paying the wrong bills, forgetting to pay bills. As a pattern, this is concerning. We're all human. We all occasionally make mistakes or forget about things. When it's dementia, it's not gonna be a one-time experience. You're gonna see this as a pattern over and over again. And that's when you really need to take it serious. So what are you gonna do if you are worried? If you were just listening to me and you're nodding your head, yep, yep, okay, worried about that. What are you supposed to do? Well, I wanna tell you about the five elements of a gold standard evaluation for the brain so you know exactly what to ask for when you go to your doctor. The five elements are a physical examination and laboratory studies, a picture of your brain called neuroimaging, this is either an MRI or a CT scan of the brain, an in-depth interview with you 
a family member, or someone that knows that person in great detail, a review of the person's medical records, including all the medications that they take and all of their medical diagnoses, and standardized pen and paper testing. So let me tell you about each one of these in more detail. Your primary care doctor is a great first stop. This should be a trusted medical professional that you feel really comfortable with that takes the time to understand your concerns. The first thing that typically happens is they're gonna take a blood test and maybe also a urine test. And what they're really looking for are treatable conditions that commonly cause older adults confusion. Very typical examples are low vitamin B12, or also high blood sugar levels. In the urine test, we get very concerned when older adults have any type of infection and specifically a urinary tract infection. If any of you have had those or care about someone who has, you know the number that they can play on the way people think, on the way that they behave. So the first pass is we have to make sure that there's nothing going on that would be an easy fix. When people come to see me as a neuropsychologist, they've typically already done this phase of the assessment the doctor typically doesn't find anything and they send them over to us or to a neurologist. I wanna teach you a little bit about the types of brain pictures that get taken that help your doctors understand what's going on with your brain. Now remember what I said a little while ago, there's a big difference between structure and function. And my personal opinion is that I think people overestimate the information that neuroimaging or pictures of the brain give us. They're very good for ruling out some things, but you cannot diagnose dementia as a result of a picture of the brain. You can absolutely tell if someone has a brain tumor, if they've had a bigger stroke, if they've had a skull fracture after a fall, if they've had a brain bleed, but you really cannot diagnose dementia. And remember what I've taught you, Part of a diagnosis of dementia is how that person is doing in everyday life, and no picture is going to be able to tell you that. The two main types of neuroimaging that we think about are CT scans of the head and MRIs of the brain. Now, both of those can be done with and without contrast, and all that that means is they've injected a radioactive dye, <laughs> sounds great, into someone's arm, and you can actually see the blood as it's moving throughout the brain. I want you to think about a CT scan of the brain, kind of like a black and white photograph. It definitely gives you a lot of information, but it's not very rich and it doesn't have a lot of details. It's quick, it's inexpensive, and this is what you're gonna get if you had a fall and you went into the emergency room, for example. And all your doctors are trying to figure out is, is there a bleed? Did this person crack their skull? It's a perfectly acceptable and the right thing to do at that time to figure out the question. If on the other hand, you're not in an emergency and your doctors really wanna get a much better understanding of the structure of your brain, an MRI of the brain is absolutely the way to go. I kind of think of it like a color photograph. It gives a lot more richness, there's a lot more detail. You can see a lot of the structures in the brain a lot better. And typically what I use it for is a rule out to make sure there isn't anything very specific. But there's also two other areas that neuropsychologists look at. The first one is what we call atrophy. Remember what I taught you earlier, as we get older, all aspects of the body shrink a little bit. You know some people as they get a little bit older, they shrink down. Well, the same thing happens in our brain, but there's a normal degree of atrophy that should happen. So the first thing I wanna know when I read an MRI report is what is the degree of shrinkage in the brain? Is it normal for that person's age? There's two aspects of atrophy that are important to know. You wanna know the general or the global atrophy. How is the overall brain doing? but sometimes different parts of the brain shrink quicker than other parts or more significantly than other parts. And I wanna know that too, because there's types of dementia that are very specific to different parts of the brain. Frontotemporal dementia is a perfect example. This is a type of dementia that in which someone's frontal lobes are undergoing a disease process and they're shrinking faster than the rest of their brain. The other thing that I care about is that blood flow. So I wanna know if the person has ever had a stroke and this goes from the big strokes all the way to those smaller silent strokes. You might be amazed how many adults are walking around who've had silent strokes who have no idea. What you need to know as a brain scientist is where in the brain the stroke has happened, 
and how big is it? Where in the brain is critical because we know what different parts of the brain do. So if I look at someone's brain scan and I can tell that they've had a stroke in the left frontal lobe, well, I know that they're going to have difficulty starting activities, sticking with activities, Maybe they're gonna have some behavior problems in that our frontal lobes are kind of like our impulse control center. So sometimes, you know, we, we were all thinking things, but it doesn't exactly get blurted out. That's what your frontal lobes do. They help kind of pump the brakes a little bit. When people have strokes or different types of brain changes that affect the frontal lobes, they're not as able to inhibit their responses as they once were. What I also want to know in terms of blood flow gets back to those little teeny tiny blood vessels. Remember before we talked about chronic ischemic small vessel disease? You are actually able to grade that as well on a brain picture. So I want to know, is that normal for the person's age or is it more moderate or is it more severe? So these are tools that the neuropsychologist and the neurologist uses to understand brain health, but it's absolutely not the total picture. The next element to a gold standard brain evaluation is a comprehensive interview with the person and someone who knows them very well. In my practice, all of our appointments are 60 minutes. In my opinion, it's very hard to understand a complex clinical problem in less than 60 minutes. I need to know the person's life history so I can understand what has changed recently that has brought them into my office. You cannot figure out something like dementia in a five to 10 minute interview. It's just not possible. Furthermore, we absolutely have to include a family member or a friend or even someone who might live in the person's residential community to be a part of that interview. One of the biological aspects of different types of dementia is an inability for the person to have insight into what's changed about their brain and the way that they act. Sometimes it's easy to think that maybe the person's in denial or it's kind of a psychological defense, but in the case of Alzheimer's disease, it really is a biological symptom for many people and they genuinely do not see the problem in the same way that somebody else might see as an outsider. I want to strongly encourage you to be a part of an evaluation if someone that you care about goes to a neuropsychologist or any type of a brain doctor. It really, really is important that the doctor understand what you've been noticing. Now, I know that this can be an incredibly sensitive topic to bring up, but I think that a good brain doctor can set the stage and make everyone in the room understand that I need to be able to hear what's going on. I need to know the truth in order for me to help you. My personal philosophy is that if something's really going wrong in the brain like dementia, it's happening whether or not we give it a name, but it's critical that we do give it a proper name because that's how we're gonna know what it is we need to do about it. And the information that a family member brings to me is invaluable. It really is better than even some of the medical tests. I need to know from an expert who knows that person what is normal for them and what has changed. So let me tell you a little bit about a neuropsychological evaluation. This is those paper and pencil tests that I was talking about earlier. If you were with me from the beginning of this program, you know that I'm a neuropsychologist and we are PhDs in clinical psychology who go on to do an additional three years of training in the brain. We're licensed state by state to assess and treat people with different brain conditions. We basically use three tools to achieve our goal of helping people. The first thing we do is we're really good listeners. We try really, really hard to understand the unique symptoms that are happening within that unique person. The next thing we do is we get a lot of medical records. We wanna understand what medications have been started, what are people's different diagnoses, what surgeries have they had, all that stuff matters. But probably our biggest tool is standardized pen and paper tests. These are things like asking people to read words out loud, listening to a short story and telling us what they remember, looking at different pictures and telling us what is the name of that object. We also want to understand things like mood, behavior, and of course, that critically important part, how is someone really doing in their everyday life? What we do after someone completes the test, which typically takes about two to three hours, 
is that we score the test. And what this means is we score how that person did, but we compare it to a reference group that is as close to that person as possible. So we have these big book of norms, and what we try to do, when I say norms, I mean normative data, and what we try to do is compare that person's score to, let's say, other 71-year-old women with a bachelor's degree. This is one of the ways that we can make statements about, well, is this normal for age or is it not? What neuropsychologists are really, really good at is integrating different sources of information and bringing it all together to figure out, are there any patterns here that are concerning for all the different things that we know can go wrong in the brain? There is absolutely a pattern for normal aging. There is a pattern for untreated sleep apnea. There's a pattern for vascular changes. There's an Alzheimer's pattern. And of course, you sometimes get mixes of different patterns. This is why we're in school for so long. We have to be able to figure all this stuff out. But neuropsychological evaluation is the gold standard in the field of truly understanding the brain. And what our real job is as neuropsychologists is to bring all of this information together. I have very rarely evaluated someone who Alzheimer's disease, as an example, is the only problem going on. There's almost always something else. For example, maybe someone had a hip replacement a year ago and they've never really been quite the same since. Maybe they've been home more because they can't get around as much and they're drinking a little bit more wine. Maybe they've also been on pain medication since that time. Maybe there's a very strong family history of strokes. Maybe as a consequence of not being able to get around a lot in pain, we also have a new problem of depression. Maybe there's also been a couple small strokes. What neuropsychologists really love to do is to get very specific on all these different contributions because what we believe is until you understand them, you don't know what you're treating. Neuropsychological evaluations typically happen in three sessions. The first one is that very important interview. The second one is the testing session. And the third one is my absolute favorite. This is the feedback session. This is when we get to communicate exactly what we think is going on with you or someone that you care about. And really what a privilege that has been for me to be able to use my experience to make people feel more clear about what's going on with them and give them the tools to know exactly what it is that they need to do to get better or to at least keep themselves at the same level of functioning that they did before. We then write up all of our findings into a report and send it back to people's medical team. Typically, this is a primary care doctor, maybe a neurologist, maybe a cardiologist, because we want everybody in the person's care team to understand what were the results of this very comprehensive evaluation, because it's critical for all aspects of the person's care, not just their brain health. So I wanna close with four strategies for getting the most that you can out of the I Care For Your Brain program. The first one is I really want you to engage with this material. Please don't just sit there and listen to me go on and on. I really want you to pay attention. I really want you to tie it back to your own life. This is the way that we make meaning out of the things that we hear. This is how we learn by making it relevant to us personally. So when I'm talking, I really want you to try to tie back my examples to your own life or to somebody that you know or care about. The second one is I really want you to interact with the companion workbook that goes along with these lectures. What they're gonna contain is all the PowerPoint slides that I use. You're gonna have a section for note writing. What you're also gonna find in the workbook is behavior tracking sheets. And I wanna tell you a little bit about these. So the whole idea is that the way you change behavior is actually paying attention to your behavior as it is now. You need to just start to pay attention. So let's just take alcohol as an example. You might not really be aware of how many glasses of wine you're having a week. When we get to the lecture on substances and how they affect the aging brain, we're gonna talk all about what are the recommendations that have just been recently put out to guide you in making these important decisions. But until you know what you're doing now, it's gonna be really hard to know what your goals are. So included in the workbook are gonna be a lot of tracking sheets and you're gonna to start to become your own brain scientist. You are going to start to understand what is it that you're doing that might be good 
or maybe not so good for the health of your brain. One thing that was really important to me when I put together this program is that at the end of every one of my lectures, what you're gonna see is a few slides that are just my references. I wanna encourage you to go seek out these primary sources on your own. If you're a computer person, I wanna make sure that you know about Google Scholar. This is a really cool free program that's on the internet where you can put in any of the articles that I reference and actually get the original article. One of the criticisms I have of the brain fitness industry is that they deliver news in these little tiny snippets and they're skewed for profit. What I want to do is present that information to you in a more objective and measured way, helping you understand the power of the result without over amplifying their possible effects. So if you get excited by something I'm talking about, you're always going to be able to go into the reference pages, find the scientific citation and look it up yourself. The third thing is I want you to figure out why are you doing this? Why are you spending your time with me today? I want you to define your motivation early and often. I want you to make your motivation crystal clear. Why are you doing this? And I want you to make it very personal. Any behavior change takes some effort. I told you before, brain health is not a quick fix. You're really gonna have to do things day in and day out. Things that aren't too hard, things that are definitely not that expensive, but it's going to take effort. You need to know why you're doing it. One example that I heard that I thought was so great is I had an 82 year old patient and he said to me, I wanna live five more years so I can see my great granddaughter graduate from high school. So what we had him do was to put her picture on the refrigerator and every day when he's trying to make better choices about what he eats in light of his type 2 diabetes that's not very well controlled, he keeps thinking of that beautiful face and that keeps him on track. So you have to take that responsibility of figuring out what is it that is going to fuel this mission for you. And the last thing is I want you to stay calm. Remember, you're gonna be thinking like a brain scientist in no time. I know that this was a lot of information coming at you. This was our first time together. Every time we're gonna be getting more and more in depth. You're gonna keep learning more and more. And by the end, I promise you, you are gonna feel so in charge of your brain health. It's gonna feel awesome. Thank you so much for joining me and I really hope to see you again.